Ephesians chapter 2 this morning really reflects the conditions of a Genesis 3 sort of world. The Apostle Paul notably states here, Ephesians 2 verse 1, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. Elsewhere, the Apostle rather starkly adds, For the wages of sin is death. Friends, despite what you might believe or hear elsewhere, the Bible boldly and yet mercifully tells us that the consequences of the historical Adam's fall are in fact doubly deadly. Doubly deadly. That is, man is subject both to physical death and decay and spiritual death because of sin. In other words, we are both dying on account of sin, and we are dead apart from grace. There's a movie that I really enjoyed in my high school years, a moving scene in that movie, one of my favorite sports movies of all time, the 2000 blockbuster hit, Remember the Titans. Coach Herman Boone, played by the actor Denzel Washington, is shown there leading his high school football team on an early morning run through the misty trails of a southeastern Pennsylvania farm. When suddenly their running stops and the camera closes in on Coach Boone, surrounded by the sweaty and heavy breathing black and white faces of his players. Anybody know what this place is? This is Gettysburg. This is where they fought the battle, he states. 50,000 men died right here on this field, fighting the same fight we are still fighting amongst ourselves today. This green field right here was painted red, bubbling with the blood of young boys, smoke and hot lead pouring right through their bodies. Listen to their souls, men. I killed my brother with malice in my heart. Hatred destroyed my family. You listen and take a lesson from the dead. If we don't come together together right now on this hollowed ground, we too will be destroyed just like they were. I don't care if you don't like each other, but you will respect each other. I don't care. I don't, I know, I don't know. Maybe we'll even learn to play this game like men. I think I could have played football for Coach Boone. Not sure that's me, guys. All right, we'll keep going. Friends, in a similar way this morning, I feel that we have stumbled onto hallowed ground here in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. I've titled my message this morning, and actually the message has three parts that we'll treat over the next three Sundays, out of the graveyard, unto good works, all by grace. You know, interestingly, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 is much like Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, and Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, which came before it, in that it is a single sentence in the original Greek text. In fact, the main verb doesn't really come until verse 5 of Ephesians 2, where we are told, God. God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. Together with Christ, by grace, you have been saved. Notice that in the midst of a reminder of death, we are given a glimpse of grace. Here in these familiar verses, we have the gospel in miniature. That is, first we are told the bad news, that humanity stands in deep solidarity in its great defiance of Almighty God and is therefore subjected to the grim and unavoidable consequences of human sin, physical death, and spiritual alienation from the life of God. In fact, Paul will later say in the book of Ephesians that you, church, must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. Again, here we're reminded of the reality of man's grave depravity, the very fact of his spiritual and mortal deadness due to sin. And this bad news 
is vital because it, oddly enough, prepares us for the good news of God's astonishing mercy and grace towards sinners in Christ. The gospel begins with bad news, but it doesn't end there. Paul says, and you were dead, Ephesians 2, 1a. Listen, one of the great tragedies of life in a Genesis 3 world is that multitudes of men and women don't even know that they are dead in sin. And therefore, they don't see how God wants to make them alive through the work of his son, Jesus Christ. But then there's the good news, by the grace of God. Ephesians 2, 4, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him. Beloved, understand this. That the biblical gospel informs us that it is God's grace through the power of the risen Lord Jesus alone. And no other power which raises our carnal corpses from spiritual death to new life with God. There is no other good news. God alone saves depraved sinners. Jonah 2.9, salvation belongs to the Lord. But for what purpose? Well, that's the third part. The purpose being, of course, good works. Out of the graveyard unto good works, all by grace. Ephesians 2.10 is not epilogue, it is essential gospel. For by grace you have been saved through faith. We know that verse. And this not for, is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Yes, we know that, not a result of work so that no one may boast. Yes, but then we stop there. We shouldn't. For Paul continues, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Those who are once dead in sin, yes, you and me, brothers and sisters, are made alive by grace and not anything that we have done for the glory of God and to do good works. That is the work of faith and obedience by the Spirit. Now, looking at the same text from a slightly different angle, for just a moment, we might be able to suggest that Ephesians 2 Verses 1 to 10 is actually kind of a real-life personal illustration of the great theological heights to which Paul had climbed earlier in chapter 1. He's not moving to something new. He's illustrating what he's already taught in principle 4. That is the power of God that worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. We spoke about that the last few weeks. Is here personified, maybe one might say demonstrated through God's merciful working of making sinful men and women undead through the power of the gospel. Listen to me. Mankind stands in need not of simple rejuvenation nor of mere renovation, nor even of sudden resuscitation, but rather of divine resurrection. We don't need a vacation. We need a resurrection. That is by grace alone through the faith, through, through the faith in the work of Jesus Christ alone. In sum, the grand diagnosis of man's spiritual condition apart from Christ is simply as follows. My thesis this morning that we are, apart from divine grace, spiritually dead transgressors and objects of divine wrath. But there's hope. There's hope. There's a way of escape which has been provided for us by grace. The fact is, though mankind was made with and still has immense dignity and responsibility, the one class of creature we're told in Genesis chapter 1 to be made in the image of a holy God, Genesis 1, 26, through Adam's disobedience and fall into sin, our entire nature has been completely corrupted and ruined by sin. And we now stand condemned, radically depraved, and in need of God's grace and resurrection through the gospel. I once was rebellious, corrupted by sin, 
pursuing the devil's dark path, oblivious, dead to the state I was in, an object of God's dreadful wrath. So therefore, Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 is a rare reality check, a wake-up call for multitudes of men and women stumbling around like zombies on the, on the set of The Walking Dead. Man's nature, that is, his inner ability to please and obey his creator and sovereign, is totally incapacitated, totally and completely flatlined. Because of the fall and apart from divine grace, man is not simply partly dead or just a little bit dead or even mostly dead. He is utterly and completely dead spiritually. Consequently, here is the Bible's sobering prognosis for us apart from divine grace that we are not only dead, as Tony Meredith states, and dying, but we are doomed. We are dead, we are dying, and we are doomed. But as apart from the gospel, humanity doesn't just need a therapist to work out our emotional distress or a psychologist to unravel the mental knots or confusion that we experience or even a skillful physician to mend our bodily burdens. But rather, we need a coroner to determine the cause of death and declare that we are dead spiritually. So the Bible itself does just such a task, aiming to sober us, or maybe better, like Lazarus, to summon us out of the grave of our depravity and sinfulness with this unwelcomed prognosis. Men and women are spiritually dead and lifeless on account of sin. So look, over against both the eternal optimists who erroneously believe that mankind is essentially good, folks like Ellen and Oprah, and the earthly pessimists who wrongly suggest that mankind is not actually dead, but rather just weak or maybe really sick. The scriptures present a much needed second opinion. Mankind is not just weak nor sick, but man is definitively dead on arrival. In fact, just briefly, note the following diagnostic tests that come to us from Scripture. Recall the story of the flood and of Noah. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and following, we are told that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. How's that for description? And here, mysterious, we're told that the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him to his heart. So that the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It's one of the beautiful things of the Bible. Just when you think we are totally lost, here comes the divine but God. Or perhaps consider the wise and wayward Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes 9 verses 2 and 3 declare it is the same for all. Since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice, as the good one is, so is the sinner. And he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, the same event that the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man, again, are full of evil. And madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. Ecclesiastes is hard to read, friends. Or perhaps consider the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17, verse 5 and following. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert 
and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, in uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. You see this divine contrast. Whose trust is the Lord? He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its root by the stream, and it does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. And here's the verse from Jeremiah 17 that you might know. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds." Not doing well according to these tests, folks. Maybe finally both the great psalmist David and the prophet, or excuse me, the apostle Paul agree. Psalm 14, 1 to 3, and Romans 3, 10 to 12. They both say the same thing. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Aren't you glad you got out of bed this morning to come to church? And listen, let there be no doubt for those of you who are listening this morning. Human nature, unaided by divine grace and the power of the risen Christ, is not just ignorant nor indifferent. It is not just inept. It is not just predisposed. It is incapacitated and utterly impotent. That is our nature due to sin. Mankind is a stone-cold sinner before God in trespasses and sins. We've missed the mark of God's perfect standard and made quite a mess of things here on earth. But God. Got to come back next week for that one. But that's not all that Paul says in this text. As if the fact that this world is a graveyard of spiritually dead men and women wasn't bad enough. Notice what else Paul says in this gravely important text. And you were dead, past tense, in the trespasses and sins. Verse 2, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. You know, I used to uh, regularly have breakfast with an elder at a former church who often would wear a t-shirt that read, Dead Man Walking, Ephesians 2, verse 2. It actually led to quite a few interesting opportunities to share the gospel and talk about matters of faith at the local diner in Brookhaven. I want you to notice that in addition to the grim prognosis of man's nature being totally dead spiritually and therefore unable to please the Lord in any way on our own, Paul adds the problem is worse because for the natural man there is also a dubious pattern, an ongoing practice of defiance and disobedience towards God by sinners. We are dead, and we are dying. I think James Boyce states the problem clearly and succinctly when he states, although the sinner indeed is dead to God, he nevertheless is very much alive to wickedness. You notice that? In other words, we are not merely sinners because we occasionally sin. We sin fundamentally and continually until our nature is radically reoriented by grace and through faith in the gospel because we are sinners. We are not just passively indifferent to God by nature. Rather, we are actively at odds, at enmity with God due to sin. Dead sinners hate God. They are at war with a holy God. And such were you. And such was I. Again, I like how Pastor Chuck Swindoll unpacks man's ongoing hostility with God from these verses as he states, quote, What was life like for us prior to God's gracious intrusion? The answer is simple. We were dead, enslaved, and condemned. Though outwardly we looked very much alive, inside we were cut off from true life because we were severed from God. 
the source of life. We were, as it were, buried under, in our trespasses and sins as a corpse is buried under dirt. We weren't merely grubby, we were interred. And just like a dead body resting six feet under, we were completely incapable of extricating ourselves from our grave situation. But again, that's not all. Swindoll continues, the unsaved walked in trespasses and sins, following actively the path set by Satan, the prince of the power of the air. Where does this zombie-like march through the valley of death lead them? Into deeper enslavement to the wicked spirit working among the children characterized by disobedience. Paul even includes himself in this category, among whom we all once lived. We lived in the lusts of our flesh, emotional depravity, Swindoll states. We indulged in the desires of the flesh, physical depravity, and we indulged in the desires of the mind, even rational depravity. There is not one corner or crevice of our existence that is not corrupted and stained by sin. So look, the point is not simply that mankind is somehow now neutral to God, preserving some weakened but as of yet still willing ability to please and obey the Lord. That is not the point. That is not our view in the Bible Fellowship Church. Rather, twisted thinking and willful wickedness completely characterize all those who are outside of the life of God. And I know this is not cheery news, but it is the truth. So then how does this ongoing enmity or war and hostility towards God play out? Well, again, I'm aided by the helpful commentary of Richard Koken, who explains the problem this way. He says that sinners are held captive in this death and sin by three kinds of bondage, what he calls a trinity of tyrants. That is the world, an external cultural tyranny, the flesh, an internal compulsive tyranny, and the devil, that is a hostile supernatural tyranny. We often talk about the world, the flesh, and the devil at odds with us. But then he adds, these, they are like three prison guards ensuring that sinners cannot escape from spiritual death. It's a good word. Friends, in other words, not only are we as sinful human beings dead in sin, understand we are further dominated by sin. We are further preoccupied with the world, with the flesh, and with the devil. There is no way to sugarcoat this, folks. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 spells disaster for man's innate ability and condition to reconcile himself to God. We are broken, and every human religion cannot reconcile us to a heavenly God. It is either grace or it is not at all. This is the point of Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. The Bible says quite clearly that a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption, those creeping into the early communities of believers. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. What are you enslaved by right now? Friends, sin has shackled our hearts to spiritual death and disobedience to God, and we can't find the key. The key is not in our own power or our own resources. It's not in our wealth. It's not in our works. The key is in the hand of Jesus. He unshackles sinners. Now, relatedly, I think in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the apostle Paul tells his young uh, pastor friend Timothy... 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, to flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, and love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses, notice, and escape from the snare of the devil 
after being captured by him to do his will. It's bad enough for us as sinful humans, but we have an evil enemy constantly trying to keep us blinded to the gospel. Satan has been actively involved from the start, enslaving humanity in sinful rebellion by blinding the hearts of unbelievers to the light of God. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 talks of this. So look, the fact of the matter is that all things being equal, and apart from the awesome power of a gracious God and his merciful work of renovating our hearts from a disgustingly deceitful and deplorable mess of filth and unrighteousness into a Christ-loving, Christ-honoring, Christ-welcoming habitat of personal righteousness and peace and joy by His Spirit. We sinful human beings would always choose our sin over God every time. We love our sin more than we love God. We would choose pride and porn and anger and envy and self-importance and self-gratification over Christ and His gracious commands. Why? Because sinning is not just something that we do. Apart from the gospel, it is in our blood. It is what we are. We sin because we are sinners. Our nature is hatred and hostility towards God's holiness. And we need a rescuer. And we are not the rescuer. Man is both dead and dying apart from the light of Christ, and he doesn't even know it. All Adam's sons, all Adam's sons are slaves to sin until and unless the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, sets them free by his spirit. Now we begin to move from the bad news to the good news. Again, the Apostle Paul nails this great need of our lives in Romans chapter 6, verses 5 and following. Note this passage with me. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. That's good. That's the gospel. So what is man's natural diagnosis but death, spiritual death, physical dying? What is man's present description? Apart from grace, it is death. It is loss. It is hostility. Man is dead. Men are dying. Therefore, what is man's natural deliverance if it's not death? Death. Die to sin. As Dane Ortland has stated in a recent book, die before you die. Christian salvation is not assistance. It is rescue. The gospel does not take our good and complete us with God's help. The gospel uh, tells us we are dead and helpless, unable to contribute anything to our rescue, but the sin that requires it. Christian salvation is not enhancing. It is resurrecting. That's good. That's gospel. It's true. Paul's terms in Romans 8 capture it quite well. Listen, Christian, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. 
For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, Paul states. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Where are you? In the flesh or in the spirit? Paul says in Romans 8, 9, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It's good. That's the gospel. Listen, there is not, there's one last bit of bad news, I'm afraid, that we need to see from this graveyard of humanity's guilt and spiritual hostility against God. And that is, firstly, again, man is spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. And secondly, sinful men and women actively and continually practice evil against God unless God moves in their heart by grace and through the work of Christ in faith. But finally, Paul tells us at the end of verse 3 that apart from grace, finally, we are by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Again, I think it was Tony Merida who said it first. We are dead, we are dying, and we are doomed apart from Christ. A Genesis 3 world really deserves a Romans 1 response. Here the Bible declares with thunderous authority, for the wrath of God, Romans 1.18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Again in Romans 3, Paul states, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of of God. But he keeps pressing on in the text. He says, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. God knows that we are doomed apart from the divine son. And so he sends the very best gift for us. Let me put it another way. The promise of Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The promise of Genesis 3.15 brings us to the provision of John 3.16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not, what? Perish. But have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Praise the Lord. How does sinful mankind, being dead in trespasses and sins, and further being actively disobedient and living in open hostility and rebellion against God's law, being alienated from the life of God, hope to avoid the doom and disaster of eternal wrath of an infinitely holy and powerful God? One word, grace. Grace. Grace is our only hope. The great modern hymn we often sing, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. Another stanza, in Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God, Colossians 2, 9, and helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, what? The wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live listen the grace of god 
as supremely demonstrated in the mercy of God by the gift of Christ and his death and resurrection for sinful humanity is the only way out of the graveyard today. The only way. So how do you, dear listener, respond to such a grim prognosis and yet such wonderfully glorious news? Imagine going to your doctor and being given a fatal prognosis. I'm sorry, where there's really not much we can do, you're dying. Don't know exactly how long, might be a matter of months, up to a year, but you, my friend, are going to die. There is one special treatment that we can do. Would you be willing to do it? Imagine getting that sort of news. Would you be willing to take that treatment? Well, friend, the fact is we have been given an escape route. It is the gospel of God's son and how he went to the cross bearing our shame and contempt on his body. And he took our sin and plunged it into the earth and left it behind when he rose from the dead. Listen, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, then there is no other more appropriate response for you than to simply rejoice. Rejoice as you remember the richness of God's grace and mercy that made you alive out of the death of your sins. Rejoice in the gospel of grace. Thank God for raising you up out of the death of your sins by the grace and goodness of Jesus. Give thanks. It's the season for it. Give thanks. But I think one of the ways we show our gratitude is by living obedient and grateful lives. So you, dear believer, how should you live in light of today's message? You should rejoice and you should remember to live obedient and grateful lives by the power of God's Spirit. However, I'm afraid that perhaps not everyone in this room is a follower of Jesus Christ this morning. How then, secondly, may you respond, dear sir or ma'am, if you are hearing this really world-rocking news and good news? How should you respond today? Well, rather than rejoicing, which you honestly, candidly can't do, you need to repent. You need to turn from your sin to the Savior. You need to turn to the Lord and plead for the Lord to make you alive by the gift of his Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something. If you ask, he will answer. If you call, he will summon you out of the death of your sins. You need to acknowledge the immense mountain of your sinfulness before a holy and almighty God. You need to admit your utter ineptitude to redeem and remedy and reconcile yourself to the Lord. That you can't do it. That that it's all of grace. And then receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ this morning. Paul puts it a lot better. He says in Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. There's really two responses that each of us should consider. To rejoice or to repent. The Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. If you call upon the Lord, he will give you the gift of repentance and will raise you up out of the tomb of your trespasses. He will grant you the ability to rejoice in the goodness and grace of Jesus. You will have new life because it is the gospel of grace that pillages and robs graveyards, enabling redeemed men and women to live to God and to do truly good works. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you, Lord, for the authority and clarity and sufficiency of your word. Thank you, Father, for the fact that it is medicine for our souls. It is the teacher that we need this morning to tell us and remind us, 
just of the extent of our brokenness before you and the extent of your lavish grace towards us. Almighty God, we rejoice in so great a salvation and ask, Lord, if there is even one here this morning who has never yet bowed the knee of their heart to King Jesus, I pray, O Lord, that you would save him or her this morning. They would call upon Jesus. They would find a friend in him and begin to walk as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, we praise you for your word. And we give you thanks in his name. Amen.